So in that category, I think all of this is helping Donald Trump. But as mm. far as whether or not people think he's an insurrectionist, people have already made up their minds. Bring on 2025 state election. I hope Western Australians use their vote wisely next time. What I'm wanting people to do is actually calm down and be a bit sober and wise. And as the Bible says, to be cunning as serpents. Hello and welcome to the Aussie Wire News. And first up this episode, we need to talk about Donald Trump. Today, the US Supreme Court has ruled on Trump's eligibility to hold office, and we'll get to that story in a moment. But to understand that story, we need first to talk about Trump. Not the man, the symbol. See, Donald Trump, whether you personally like it or not, has come to represent hope to a very significant proportion of the US population. There's many tens of millions of true believers in the US, backed by many tens of millions more supporters, who are backed by many tens of millions more people saying, well, we don't love him, but he's better than the other guy. And if you're wondering, I personally fit into that third group. I think there are a lot of valid criticisms of Donald Trump, but I still think he's better than the other guy. But through good fortune and timing, the last time I was in the US just a few weeks ago, I was able to attend the Trumpets fundraising event for Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. And I need to talk to you about what I saw, because you can't understand US politics or the upcoming US presidential election without first understanding a little bit about what Trump has come to represent. Mar-a-Lago was, of course, beautiful, and we had to go through three different Secret Service checks, including airport-style security, and of course, everything from the music to the food and the decorations were absolutely first class, but you expected that already. This was a room full of true believers, that's obvious as well, but what I didn't expect was the level of fervour from multi-millionaires in their 50s and 60s. I watched in astonishment as these well-heeled, successful people, some famous in their own right, you might recognise some, were competing with each other to hold a spot at the velvet rope in the hope of shaking Trump's hand. Personally, I abandoned the velvet rope. It was just too absurd for me. So I took a step back and started filming on my phone. And that's what you'll be watching in just a moment. Now, my purpose in filming was not so much to film Trump, but to film the circus that surrounds him. Of course, there's layers of security and secret service. And yes, I'll reiterate, this was a room full of true believers. So of course, you'd expect them to be enthusiastic. But these people are mature aged, wealthy, often famous in their own right, and they wanted nothing more than to encourage Donald Trump, to financially support Donald Trump. And he's a man far wealthier than most of them. They wanted to empower Donald Trump, even though he's already more powerful than most of them are or ever will be. And therein lies both the enigma and the key. You know, a similar circus surrounds someone like mm, Taylor Swift, but people want to meet Taylor Swift for themselves, to show off to their friends, to say they've done it. And sure, there is certainly some of that in this room. But if you could hear people, and I could sometimes, if you could hear what they were saying in those brief encounters, what these people want is to use that momentary interaction to encourage Trump to thank him, to pledge their unwavering support, no matter what happens to him in the courts, and to urge him to keep going for their sakes. See, Donald Trump isn't so much a celebrity as he is a symbol. Ironically, a symbol of hope and change. And this room full of wealthy and powerful people are pledging to use their wealth and power to support an even more wealthy and powerful person in the form of Donald Trump. Why? Why would they do that? Well, because they see their future as intrinsically linked with his. And it's not just the rich and powerful who feel that way. I mean, sure, the rich and powerful were the ones in this particular room. But we see from his rallies that Trump is supported by tens of millions of Americans from all walks of life. And Trump is now a veteran political campaigner. He is savvy, and he's playing his cards very carefully. One of the most important decisions that a US presidential candidate makes is who they will choose to be their vice presidential running mate. It is vitally important to pick a VP who appeals to a different but sympathetic demographic. It has to make sense that that person is your running mate, but at the same time, there's no point picking someone who's just gonna to appeal to only the exact same people. 
That's why it was interesting to me when Donald Trump walked into the Trumpets event with Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, of course, was Trump's opponent in the primaries earlier on, but he failed to poll well and he bowed out early. It would appear that Vivek has since then been angling for the VP pick on Team Trump. Now, Vivek and Trump had had dinner together elsewhere at Mar-a-Lago before coming into the Great Hall to the Trumpets event where we were. And the dinner must have gone well because Trump was over an hour late in arriving into our room. That says that that was a pretty good dinner. They walked in together, which was always going to ignite a firestorm of speculation, and Trump knows that. So this was a deliberate tactical move. Either he's foreshadowing who his VP pick is going to be, or he recognizes that the speculation is a good thing in and of itself. Vivek as VP makes sense in some ways. Vivek is far younger. He's a minority, which shouldn't matter, but sadly it seems like it does. He's very intelligent, articulate, and he's clean. Picking Vivek as his VP would do a lot to clean up Trump's image. But the problem is that if you drew a Venn diagram of Vivek supporters and Trump supporters, Vivek's circle would be almost entirely contained within Trump's. It's hard to argue that Vivek would bring a lot of new voters to Trump, except for the third rail, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He's running as an independent, and third-party or independent candidates have, in the past, changed the outcome of US presidential elections because... They don't have a preferential system like what we have in Australia, so each new candidate splits the vote. And this can be a real problem when you have two candidates who appeal to similar psychographics because they might accidentally split their majority support and now a minority candidate wins. Now, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a strong independent candidate, potentially the strongest that we've ever seen. He's polling well, people are listening to him, and he has the Kennedy name, one of the most valuable names in US politics, certainly on the Democratic side. But what makes Robert F. Kennedy Jr. a little bit special is that he appeals not only to the disillusioned Democrats, but he makes a lot of sense to conservatives and even the Republicans that may not necessarily love the idea of another Trump presidency. So Trump is at risk of losing votes to this third rail, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., And Trump can't allow that to happen. But what do you do about it? Well, it's actually in that context that it starts to make sense to me that Trump might use his VP pick as a defensive move against Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And in that context, Vivek Ramaswamy starts to make a lot of sense. Vivek and RFK Jr. have a lot in common. They've said a lot of similar things. They advocate a lot of similar things. And there would be a proportion of Kennedy supporters who might be planning to vote for Kennedy right now, but they could be persuaded to not throw away their vote on a third party candidate and switch to voting for Trump if Vivek were Trump's vice presidential pick. So to wrap up and summarize what I saw at the Trumpets event in Mar-a-Lago last month, I saw exactly the kind of hype and passion that you would expect But I also saw a savvy political operator who, in my opinion, is very aware of the task in front of him and is taking nothing for granted. For political junkies like me, this is going to be a very interesting year. Now, let's hear from our North America correspondent, Julie Hartman, to find out what the Supreme Court has ruled regarding Donald Trump's eligibility for office. Here's the news. Well, we turn our attention now to the Supreme Court's decision around the eligibility of Donald Trump to be on the ballot for the U.S. presidential election. There are many, many tens of millions of Americans hoping for either of the two possible results. So either way, this is going to be controversial. It's going to have a very, very big impact. And our North America correspondent, Julie Hartman, joins us right now to talk about it. Julie, thank you so much for joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Thanks for having me, Topher. For the benefit of those who may not be political junkies and certainly maybe not North American political junkies, as most of our audience here is Australian, can you bring us up to speed with what's happened to lead us to the point where the whole of the US is kind of waiting on tenterhooks for this decision from the Supreme Court? Sure, I'll just say it's not even intuitive for those of us who are Americans and those of us (laughs) who are American uh, political junkies. But Basically, what this comes from is that there is a part of our Constitution in our Bill of Rights, which says that you are forbidden from holding public office if you have engaged in an insurrection. And so this is the 14th Amendment specifically, and it was 
enshrined in our law after our civil war because basically people wanted to prevent slave owners, those who were in the Confederacy who wanted to secede from the Union to create, you know, a slave country from holding public office. So that's the origin um, of this of this law, this stipulation. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened, Topher, is that various states, including Colorado, have picked out this part of our Bill of Rights and said, well, it's right there. Donald Trump is an insurrectionist. And so thus, according to the law, he cannot hold public office. Mm. And so what happened today is that our Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, 9-0, even the justices who were nominated to the Supreme Court by Democrats mm. agreed that this is ridiculous. And they ruled that basically Colorado can't do that. And it is up to uh, Congress at the federal level to make a decision about what constitutes an insurrectionist, what that term means, mm. and if Donald Trump fits it's the bill. But basically, we most of us know this is just political persecution. This is just trying to put up roadblocks to make Donald Trump the next president. And thankfully, our Supreme Court sees right through it. Well, there's a couple of things to this for me. Uh, and it's obviously made, made headlines all around the world. Here's a headline from Australia on this. The decision, if, if I'm honest, the decision was made on a bit more of a jurisdictional issue than a substantial issue. The Supreme Court has not ruled that Donald Trump did not engage in insurrection, although I don't think he did. But that's, right. not, that's not actually the ruling here. The ruling is simply that the Colorado um, jurisdiction does not have the power to, to, to make such a decision. Do you think that this, I mean, obviously it's being trumpeted as a very, very big legal victory. Do you think that this helps Trump in terms of his fight against this idea that he is an insurrectionist? Hmm. I'm not sure if it helps in that category. I think Americans are pretty have pretty much made up their minds. Those sure. who think he is an insurrectionist still believe that, and those who don't, you know, haven't changed their minds either. But mm. I I do think this helps him. All of this persecution helps him uh, politically. In fact, there is a columnist in the Wall Street Journal named Holman Jenkins Jr., mm -hmm. and he contends that it is actually the Biden uh, re-election campaign strategy to levy these ridiculous charges and political persecutions against Donald Trump because Jenkins says that they want Americans to be incensed. They want Americans to put up Donald Trump as the nominee because the only way that President Biden thinks that he can win a second time if, is mm -hmm. if it's Biden versus Trump because he thinks a lot of Americans will vote for him because they hate Trump. So in that category, I think all of this is helping Donald Trump. But as mm -hmm. far as whether or not people think he's an insurrectionist, People have already made up their minds. Well, I got to say, if uh, if that was an insurrection on January sixth, then that was uh, one of the worst insurrections <laughs> I've ever seen. And how a country with four hundred million guns in it could have a bunch of people show up at the Capitol for an insurrection, allegedly, and all of them left their guns at home—at least the ones that went into the Capitol certainly left their guns at home—just uh, seems like one of the worst insurrections in human history. Uh, Trump, of course, has been quick to jump yep. on this decision to claim victory. Uh, he went on the record here, uh, you know, the usual campaign trail sort of stuff. But there was something that really caught my attention in this speech, and we were just chatting about it uh, prior to recording, Julie, and that is where Trump is arguing and urging f the need for immunity for presidents. And, and to be clear about what, what he says in this, in this speech that we're showing here, he talks about immunity for presidents for, for decisions they've made whilst president, uh, but it's an ongoing immunity for, for, that applies while they are still the president and then continues to apply afterwards for decisions made while they were a president. Um, he's obviously looking at this through the lens of the accusations being levied against him and, and the sort of legal pursuits that people have had of him. Do you think that that's the correct solution to this particular problem? I can understand those who are hesitant to endorse that position. You know, it seems like a draconian idea that a president can be immune from any decisions, no mm. matter how terrible they are, that they make in office. But I actually think when Donald Trump is making this statement, yes, you're right that he's viewing it through the lens of the, his, the own political persecution that he is facing. But he's also aware that if he is granted immunity while he is president, then other presidents, including his opponents, mm. are also granted immunity. So I really do think from him it is coming from a principle pers 
principled perspective where he's saying, look, it's very difficult to be the president of the United States. You've got to make really tough decisions sometimes. And we need to feel like we have the freedom to do that without criminal liability. So yeah. I would I would uh, at least right now support what mm. he says in, in that assertion. For me as a libertarian, I, I do find this a tough one. And you're quite correct. Um, Trump has been very, very clear that this is not just about him. This is something that he believes should apply to every single president. So you're absolutely correct in that sense. It right. is a principled stance that applies to his opponents as well. Uh, but I've got to say there is a certain level of discomfort for me at the idea of, of some sort of a blanket immunity. Uh, I, I would love to find a, um, a more precise way that, that pr protects them from the tough decisions they do have to make. I mean, they do at times make life and death decisions. There's no, there's no denying that. Um, and I would hate to think that, uh, that they have in the back of their mind this fear of frivolous or vexatious lawsuits. On the other hand, immunity is a very, very dangerous thing to give to anybody. So I've, I've got to admit that sits uncomfortably with me. Turning our attention to the campaign ahead, now that Donald Trump has the green light, of course, Super, tu uh, Super Tuesday uh, is tomorrow, your time. It's it's today, ours uh, here in Australia, and we're going uh, to we're going to see the race take a lot more shape. But Trump is the runaway nominee uh, at this point in time for the Republicans. It does seem pretty inevitable that he's going to be the re Republican nominee. The VP pick, I talked about that in my editorial just now. What are your thoughts uh, on Donald Trump's VP pick? And in particular, uh, I want to draw attention to Vivek Ramaswamy. I just talked in my editorial about the fact that he joined Trump at the Trumpets event in Mar-a-Lago a couple of weeks ago in person. I was there uh, and, uh, and saw that. Do you think that's him telegraphing his VP pick or is he just, I guess, reveling in the speculation and the attention that he can draw to his campaign by by keeping everyone on, on, on a... a, a on, a, on tender hooks. I will answer this, but just a final quick note about immunity, because sure. I really do understand your, your hesitation with it. I think what's hard for us as Americans right now is that we live in a country, and I know that you also have it in Australia, which is so heavily legalized, mm. where there is a there was a lawsuit recently where someone who ate uh, too hot of chicken nuggets at McDonald's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, you can sue somebody over basically anything these mm. days. Mm and get a victory. So I think that's a lot of uh, why I support at least immunity, because I have seen how uh, reckless and superfluous people are in the United States with their casual relationship with the law if they sure. think that they can tank their opponents and make some money. So, so just wanted to make that point. But as far as the vice president, boy, you're not the only one with an immense amount of speculation. <laughs> I do think Vivek Ramaswamy is at the, the top of the list for Donald Trump's VP. I happen to love the guy. I think mm. he is immensely competent and brilliant. Mm. And he uh, has almost identical uh, values and policy positions uh, to the president. But, you know, I think as far as uh, Donald Trump bringing Vivek Ramaswamy to Mar-a-Lago, I think he's taking the temperature of the voters, you know, Sure. He's certainly trying to draw attention to himself, but I think he uh, likes to bring forth many of these people who he is considering. He was also just at a rally recently with Senator Tim Scott mm -hmm. of South Carolina, who's on his short list. And I think that's a smart way for him to gauge how people react to it, because as a president, you want to pick a vice president who will compliment you and who the voters may prefer in some ways uh, if you, the candidate, has a shortcoming. So mm -hmm. I think it's just a little test on his part. Well, it's certainly going to be very interesting. And for political junkies like me, a U.S. presidential election year is always promises to be a good year full of things to talk about. So, Julie, I've no doubt we'll be getting you on many more times here on the Aussie Wire. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you. Well, the West Australian government are crowing about the world's toughest or Australia's toughest gun laws, as though that's an inherently good thing. I'm not convinced and neither is my next guest. Kate Fantanel, a.k.a. Lady Liberty, welcome to the Aussie Wire. Good to be back, Taper. Now, we've, we've had you on before. We've talked about the gun situation. West Australia, in my mind, used to be the land of the free. I used to tell people if West Australia would just hurry up and secede from Australia and become its own country, I would move over there. I've changed my mind on that point, And these gun laws are one of the reasons why. What's this latest reform all about? Well, Topher, what we've seen happen in Western Australia since it became a one-party state under the Western Australian Labor Party government is a total trampling of civil liberties. We saw it with the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act, where they tried to tell farmers what they can and can't do on our properties. 
And now they have come in with the big gun confiscation, limiting the number of firearms we can own with an arbitrary number of up to five. And they're also using our views, attitudes and opinions as part of the fit and proper person test. It's absolutely what's crazy what's happening over here. And it's it's not the land of the free that it used to be. Well, that last point is terrifying, but I want to get to the specifics of these reforms in just a moment. First, you mentioned the, the West Australian Aboriginal and Cultural Heritage Laws. They were very quickly abandoned because the, the pushback, the reaction against those laws was just so vast and so so intense that they, they ultimately just dropped them and walked away from them. Do you think the same thing is possible here with these gun reforms or, or, or does it look like these are going to stick? I think Western Australians have realised that voting in one party that controls both houses is not good for democracy in the long run. Of Mm. course, in 2021, when we had the last state election, that was an election based on keeping the border closed, which we resoundingly voted to do that. Now, fast forward, we're a year out from the next election and the Labor Party has used that time to rush through legislation to suit their ideology. Mm. They are not listening to the people. They have not consulted properly. It's been disingenuous consultation in relation to the Firearms Act and the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act. You also see it with the fishers and the logging industry. They have steamrolled over all these sections of society. Mm. And I think you find next year's election will be quite interesting indeed. Well, fingers crossed. Let's get into some of the specifics of this reform here. These are screenshots taken directly from the West Australian Government website. The headline here is Historic Reform to Deliver Toughest Firearms Laws in the Nation. The very language of this press release, the very language of this headline uh, assumes that that's an inherently good thing. I have to assume, based on this, that West Australia must have had the worst firearms crime in the nation. There must have been a massive problem that they're trying to solve here, Kate. Well, that's the thing. There is no problem. And the government is being very disingenuous with creating a problem that simply doesn't exist. Most of the gun crime, if not all of the gun crime, is with illegal firearms that the bikies have obtained illegally again. There are already laws in place in relation to illegal firearms. What these new laws are doing are punishing law-abiding people who just happen to use firearms for our sport, recreation, for hunting, to help pest control with farmers. Mm. There is no gun crime problem in WA, in Australia at all. In fact, gun crime was falling before 96 laws were introduced. We'd never have had this culture of gun crime in Australia. It's been very rare. So what they are doing is creating a problem out of thin air to push through an ideology to change the laws to suit them. But according to them, they've done it all in exactly the right ways. This is uh, just a a screenshot zoomed in on the same web page here. I quote, Western Australia is set to become the first jurisdiction in the country to impose a limit on the number of firearms a licensed firearm holder uh, can own. Now, that limit, as you said a moment ago, is five for people for recreational shooting and hunting, and it's 10 for people in in competitive shooting. My question is, how does this help? As far as I'm aware, I only have two hands Uh, How does limiting the number of guns to five actually change how many I can use at one time? How does this help gun crime? Well, it doesn't. And that's the point. We have a genuine reason test in Australia that's applied in every state and territory. You have to prove why you need or want a firearm. Capping people at a limit of five erodes the fit and proper person test. It Mm. puts a cap on the limit. It's also a deterrent. I feel it's a deterrent so that the next generation of Aussies are deterred from getting involved in shooting, which will see the skills used of hunting and marksmanship. The next generation will not have the same opportunities Mm. that you and I have had to learn fit and proper handling of firearms, safe firearms handling, something that I've been raised and I appreciate. It's taught me discipline. I've got a great relationship with my father because of it. And what I fear is this government is trampling over a strong culture and tradition of safe firearms handling in our country. Mm. Now, coming out of the second point here, proposed laws were created through extensive consultation. Now, uh, Kate Fantanel, you have been a gun rights uh, advocate and activist for many years now. You're known as Lady Liberty here in Australia. You've been prominent within the firearms uh, shooting community in West Australia. So I can only imagine they must have been falling all over themselves to consult with you. What was your involvement in the consultation and how did the consultation go? Well, you might recall when I ran for the Senate, I ran on a platform of give gun owners a fair go. I went to the police minister's office and and offered to debate him on firearms laws. 
he blocked me on all social media and as part of the consultation process, none of my emails, phone calls and my long form submission were even responded to. So mm. I've heard from other firearm groups as well that the consultation has not been in, in the t intent of how it's meant to be. And I've also heard that it's the Western Australian police who have been writing, ghost writing these laws. It is no longer the politicians and the departments who are formulating laws in WA. It's the police who are meant to be the ones enforcing, not writing the laws. So if I can summarise here as best as I can tell, we have a non-problem, that being gun crime in West Australia, that's being solved by a, a non-solution really because it's not going to take any of the firearms out of the hands of actual criminals and, and people that, that are committing any the, the few crimes that do occur with firearms uh, that is all based on a sham consultation uh, and has been written by the enforcers, not by your legislators. Look, it sounds like democracy is functioning really well in Western Australia. Bring on 2025 state election. I hope Western Australians use their vote wisely next time. I hope we see the parliament turn on its head because at the moment they are not representing the people. Now, Kate, if people wanted to get active about this, is, is, there, is there anyone that they could look to in West Australia, in politics, in, in advocacy, etc.? Is there really anywhere to go or is this just a bit of a situation where for, at least for now they're going to have to suck it up? I mean, there's people like me out there trying to fight the good fight. I know the sporting shooters organisations are trying to mobilise on the ground and get sh shooters because predominantly we've been quite quiet mm. and gun shy um, on political things. But now is the time. It's no longer to be shy. We need to rise up and say this is our sport, this is our culture, this is our traditions leave us alone and go and do some real police work. And I would add to that, these are our human rights. Kate Fantanel, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Thanks, Topher. Well, one of the things that we are very supportive of here at the Aussie Wire are conferences. And many people say, well, what's the point of a conference? It's just a talk fest, a whole bunch of people getting together. Well, those of you that have been following the Aussie Wire, you'll already know my answer to that is getting like-minded people into the same room where they can reignite the passion and sharpen the, sharpen the sword, so to speak, of, uh, of intellectual rigour between each other is always a very good thing. And I love going there because I get to interview really, really interesting people and bring those interviews to you here on the Aussie Wire. So on that front, we've actually got a really good couple of weekends coming up and I wanted to talk to Dave Pello who is responsible for the existence of the Church and State Conference about what he's doing and also about what we're doing. To decrypt that little uh, little nugget, uh, here is Dave Pello from Church and State. Dave, how are you? Very well, thank you Topher. Thanks for having me on. It's an excellent note and, and thought and you know I actually had um, an engagement with somebody on Facebook recently who highlights the reason why we need these conferences. There's lots of people who've been woken up over the last three, four years, mm. um, and there's a whole lot of people who are barking furiously, just wanting to be let off the chain like dogs, but they're not actually biting anything or making any progress. There's mm. not a lot of effectivism going on. Um, there's lots of activism going on. But what we actually want to change is culture. And in this engagement, I was advocating advocating for uh, Norco to be put back on the shelves by Woolworth supermarkets sure. wanting to fight globalism and uh, the you know price gouging and and promoting Australian owned stuff and this person raised as a tangent and a red herring uh, the the uh, some of the things that Norco is investing in they're wanting to diversify their income and they're getting into making ultimately synthetic milk. Right. Um, now this sounds a bit like the globalism agenda to replace dairy farms, and sure, that's what they're that's the market that they're appealing to. But we can't fight both of those battles at the same time. Mm. And this person's just going off the deep end and really undermining and attacking the opportunity to promote Australian dairy farmers who mm. are the shareholders of Norco. Mm. And so. What I'm, what I'm wanting people to do is actually calm down and be a bit sober and wise. And as the Bible says, to be cunning as serpents in the way we attack things and not mm. just spraying like a machine gun at every good idea that comes through our mind, because that is what an echo chamber is. Yeah. We're only then talking to people who already agree with us. We actually have to be persuasive. And to do that, we have to pick our battles pick our timing and not be unbalanced, um, overheated uh, like a drunkard. We actually mm. need to be sober and persuasive in what we do. So these conferences, yes, 
they're uh, a bit of preaching to the choir, but the choir needs preaching. Mm. Um, everybody needs encouragement. You're not alone in this. You do have like-minded people who are with you. Mm. But at the same time, it's not true that everybody knows everything already. And so, you know, the humility we need instead of right-wing virtue signaling is to actually get into a room and, and get under the teaching of people who are studied and specialized and focused and devote a whole lot of their lives to to being teachers in various fields. Now, you can eat the fish and spit out the bones, but if we don't go to these conferences, if we don't watch content such as what you're making, mm. then we're actually just going to be uh, feathering our own kind of echo chamber. And, and so it's actually important to come to learn at these uh, channels like yours and, and conferences that we're both doing as well. Well, I've been saying for quite some time that you get the government you deserve, which means that if we want a better government, we have to become better people. And these conferences for me really are, are about that. They're about people, as you say, walking into the room and saying, you know what, I don't know everything. And I'm not necessarily going to agree with everything that I hear and everything that I get told, uh, but I am at least going to challenge my thinking and allow that to sharpen my thinking. Even if it doesn't Correct. necessarily change my thinking, it still sharpens it by, be, by, by challenging the status quo inside your own mind. Tell me a little bit about uh, the Church and State Conference. You've got the CAS 24 coming up, which is the 7th annual Australian Church and State Summit. This is kind of the big one as far as Church and State is concerned, but you've also held conferences uh, besides the summit all over Australia. Tell us about it. Correct. So we've been doing it in Brisbane for a while, and it was always meant to be an Australian conference, a, yeah. a summit, and that's what we call the Brisbane one, the summit, because it's not just focused on Queensland issues. Uh, but we also do, uh, we, we're basically adding one state per year as we go on. This will be the seventh summit in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. But uh, this year we'll be in Perth for the third time. We'll be in Adelaide, sorry, we'll be in Adelaide for the third time, Perth for the second time, and Tasmania, Hobart and Launceston mm -hmm. for the first time, as well as combining with you in Albury. There's yeah. been a lot of Victorians and uh, New South Welshmen who have wanted the church and state um, franchise, for want of a better term, the, the ministry to come to uh, those states. Um, and it just really takes a good invitation that will help facilitate and, and make it affordable. Otherwise, yeah. you know, there's there's a, a lot of overheads and, and you know that, but people watching may not <laughs> know. They say, why don't we meet in a park? And well, because Qantas doesn't take goodwill. Um, mm -hmm. Hotels don't take goodwill. Mm -hmm. And there's, I mean, there's more than the venue to uh, try and save money on. That's but right. um, those invitations and, and local partners will help us each grow um, as we go, mm. uh, now the uh, the summit coming up is is the pinnacle event, that's, and it's that's literally be this weekend. That's right. It's uh, just days away now. Mm. There's not many catering tickets left. We've had to close off those numbers. We we guesstimated we could sell a few more than we already sold, but um, after that, you can buy a BYO ticket. Where whereas you'll have that is you'll have to pop out to Macca's during the lunch break. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, great conference. We've got thirty speakers over. 24 segments, um, which is six sessions across two days. Um, major themes that we're going to be focusing on include the Middle East conflict, prostitution, which is something being completely decriminalised um, to the great harm of, of people around Australia, as well as um, education. Education is a massive front that we need to take control of and leadership of, at least in our own families, if we want to take back this Australian culture. And mm. that is exactly how we lost it, by by seeding uh, education and, and the major institutions along with it mm. to the Marxist left. Well, the full program for the uh, the Brisbane Summit is on your website, churchandstate.com.au. I will be there. I'm speaking on the Saturday, but I'll be there for the entire program. I look forward to listening. And I'm going to take the opportunity, of course, to do some interviews with some of these incredible speakers that you've gathered from around Australia and uh, even from outside of Australia a little tip if you want to know who that is you're going to have to go to the the website churchandstate.com.au and have a look at the program and then literally only a week after you have your summit uh, you've actually aided in bringing Church and State to Albury alongside the Friedman Conference and the inaugural Big Ideas for a Better Australia Conference. The Aussie Wire are proudly involved. I'm actually going to be the MC for all three days. And this is kind of, it's, it's a one-day Church and State Conference on the Saturday wedged in between the Friedman Conference and this Big Ideas for a Better Australia. First time in Albury, but it's not quite the first time in a regional centre, is it, Dave? You've, you've been to other regional centres with Church and State previously. Yeah, look, I love the uh, regional invitations. Mm. Um, Coffs Harbour, Dolby, 
uh, Gympie. There's a few, a few, a few in Brisbane, in Queensland, because it's a shorter drive for me. <laughs> uh, Coffs Harbour was a really great one. And anywhere people want us to come, you know, some of the country towns that um, we've brought speakers to are actually some of the best ones, I find, because, mm. you know, there's 100, 120 people in a small church and all the ladies have cooked and, and catered <laughs> and there's no charge for the venue. And we can mm. literally do the conference for free yeah. because the, the donations and the, the free will offerings um, cover our overheads mm. um, to get a couple of speakers there, etc. Mm. And so um, they're actually really rewarding. And I love... I was born in I was born in Redcliffe, but um, I was yeah. raised, spent most of my childhood in um, in country Australia, and and it's um, the part that I love to get back to as mm. as much as possible. So getting to the regions is an opportunity that I will look for any way to make uh, possible. Later mm. this year, we're going to be doing a pre-election tour of Queensland, um, uh, myself and the Queensland State Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, and we'll be going to marginal seats that have uh, the opportunity to make the biggest difference in the state election mm. and literally holding education seminars on on why God says your involvement in the public square is not just a good idea but an indispensable idea. Mm. It's, it's part of the Great Commission to make disciples of nations and to teach them what he taught us uh, and mm. to then illuminate and bring revelation and light to um, the, the public square and rebuke injustice and mm. intervene wherever we can where there's oppression. Now, this isn't um, something that is well taught in a lot of churches, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time getting theolo people's theology um, adjusted to the Word of God, and then we're going to be speaking about the really important issues. But that's going to be a regional tour. Yeah. yeah. Um, so really looking forward to that and really excited about your initiative to uh, bring these three conferences to Albury in one weekend. Yeah, well, it's something that's been discussed for a very long time and it suddenly came together and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have had enough sway to have been able to bring it to uh, to Albury. It's a, it's a part of the world that's very close to my heart. I would just want to mention here, we've got the Freedman Friday and that's a half day that runs from about lunchtime when we start the conference uh, through into the evening. And on that evening, we've got VIP drinks for those that are VIP ticket holders and you want to spend some time hanging out with the speakers that have been flown in from all over Australia. Then we have Church and State Sunday. This is the big day of the conference. It's the biggest single day. It's absolutely packed. We've got some phenomenal speakers, including Pastor Matthew Littlefield, a co-author of the Ezekiel Declaration, and so many other fantastic people. Also a guy called Dave Pello. Uh, you know, I guess you've got to take the good with the bad as well there, Dave. Uh, <laughs> but then in the evening of the Saturday, we have the Net Zero launch at the Gala Dinner. That's going to be an absolute hoot. So much fun. You're going to see Senator Malcolm Roberts and Senator uh, Ralph Babette as you've never seen them before. I promise you that. Uh, we're going to have tremendous fun. We have some special guests uh, and there might even be a uh, one Donald Trump uh, stopping by and possibly even a Klaus Schwab dialing in. Uh, now, whether they're the real deal or whether they're an AI deep fake, of course, I can neither confirm nor deny, but it's going to be a tremendously <laughs> fun night. I promise you that. And then finally on the Sunday, I'm super excited about the big ideas for a better Australia because I believe, and I know you do too, Dave, that uh, we have not peaked. The best is yet to come. And that's Absolutely. really what that, um, that that Big Ideas Sunday is all about. Well, Dave Pello, I want to say thank you to you for creating the Church and State Conference uh, and then for partnering with the Aussie Wire, with Friedman and with Big Ideas to be able to bring that to Albury. I'm looking forward to being at the summit this weekend. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing you in Albury a weekend after that. So churchandstate.com.au for tickets to the summit in Brisbane and tripleconference.com for tickets to the Triple Conference in Albury. We'll put those links in the description. Dave Pello, thank you so much for joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Looking forward to seeing you soon, Topher. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for watching the Aussie Wire News. We work tirelessly to bring you news based on truth, freedom and hope. And we make the most of every opportunity, such as the opportunity to see a Trump event at Mar-a-Lago firsthand, to get closer to the stories that are shaping our world today. Now, if you appreciate our work, can I ask you to please become an insider via the link below. That's a financial supporter of The Aussie Wire. You'll be funding our work and making it possible for us to keep bringing you news based on truth, freedom and hope. We release new episodes of the news every Tuesday and Thursday at 4pm. You can catch up on past episodes at theaussiewire.com, follow all our socials via at the Aussie Wire, and don't forget to become an insider via the link in the video description. I'm Topher Field, and this is The Aussie Wire.